back. We're going to uh, take a look at chapter six. And I'm not going to get too far into chapter six, but there's a couple of key things. There is not another chapter in this book that's more important for you to do the pre-work. You have got to look at the, um, at, at the, read the chapter. You've got to watch the videos before you get started in here because chapter six becomes the crux of finance. And, and it, um, it's not hard, but it's complex when you first look at it. And so the, the repeated way that you hear the content from different sources, so read it, watch the videos, watch this. We'll do more problems in class. It's important that you do the problems as well to get comfortable with, with what the process is to come up with what cash flows are. So what chapter six starts to do is figure out what that cash flow number is. So up until now, we've said, well, if you spend $100,000, you are going to get $25,000 in year one, $25,000 in year two, and then we're going to discount it at some rate and, and come up with an NPV. Well, you know how to calculate the NPV, but now we need to learn how to do the pieces. And later, we're going to learn how, where that rate comes from. But right now, what we're going to learn is where does that $100,000 come from? And where, how do we know it's $25,000 in year one? Where do those numbers come from? And it starts with accounting. So we start with financial statements, and then, but then we move into converting them to cash flows. Now, there's a, there's a problem in this book, um, a, a problem about Baldwin a Manufacturing Company. And I'm going to walk through that in class, that entire problem in class uh, after, the, um, after the exam next week. So definitely read that ahead of time. And you're going to be confused as you read it. We're going to go through in, in minute detail so that you uh, have a sense for what's going on with Baldwin. But let's get, but read through it ahead of time. Even if it doesn't completely make sense, it will make a whole lot more sense if you've, if you've at least looked at it before we, uh, we start talking about it. Today, what I want to cover is the basics of what's going on with cash flows. So what we know is that if we look at an income statement, we have uh, revenues that we may or may not have received cash for. We recognize them when we shake hands and say we're going to make a deal. So we'll have a revenue number, but it, it's not related to cash. And we know the way value is created is through, through the, tra the um, transaction of cash. So the revenues might not be realistic in terms of cash. We have depreciation that's been taken out before we get to a profit figure. Um, we have interest expense that relates to how we fund it. What we want to do in this chapter is figure out what the cash flows, cash flows, not profits, cash flows are that are associated with the operations of the business, of, of operations of, of the core business. We're going to get to, in, to in, uh, interest expense later on. But the, the big, there's a couple of, of key things to know in this chapter. One, we're talking about cash flows. When we look at a problem that says we, we spend $100,000 and we get $25,000 year one, $25,000 in year two, that $100,000, those $25,000, those are cash flow numbers. They are not accounting profits. They're not income. Know that if we look at an income statement, we have revenues, less costs, um, less interest expense. One of the costs that has been taken out is depreciation. And remember, depreciation is a lovely concept. It matches the big purchase of an asset with when we're using the asset. That's important. But from the standpoint of cash, it's not a cash flow number. You may remember in an earlier chapter, uh, we calculated operating cash flow as EBIT plus depreciation minus taxes. EBIT is as close to a cash-ish kind of number on an income statement, but it had depreciation taken out. So we throw depreciation back in to get it closer to cash. And then we subtract out taxes. And taxes come about because we're in business. And when you're in business, you have to pay taxes. So taxes are a relevant cash flow associated with operations as well. Often when you're looking at this and you're, and you're going to undertake a project, and we're going to start today, and we're going to use a piece of land um, that we already own um, to set up a new factory. Um, and before we decided to go forward with this project, we did some research and, um, and we discovered that there was a market for this project. Or we did a, a, a study to see if the land was strong enough to hold the factory. You know, sometimes land has got a landfill underneath or some reason that we couldn't use the land. Anytime that you've done anything before you started the project and you have to pay those costs regardless of whether you go forward with the project, I did some research, I graded the land, I did a marketing study ahead of time. 
those costs, because you have to pay them, regardless of whether or not you go forward, those are just considered sunk costs and they are not relevant to the cost of, the, of this project. So if you have to pay it, they're relevant to your company. Your company's got to pay them, but your project shouldn't be saddled with those costs. You've got to pay them anyway. They're called sunk costs and they're not relevant to, um, to the cost of undertaking the project. There are some opportunity costs though. I said we have a piece of land and the land costs, if, if we were to sell it to somebody else, we would get $100,000 for it. Or if we used it for a different project within our company, um, they would be charged that $100,000. That land, even though it's sitting there and we're not doing anything with it right now, if it has another opportunity for what we could use it for, that's a relevant cost to our project. So just because we already bought it and we already own it doesn't mean that it doesn't have an alternative use. So if there's an alternative use that you can value, that opportunity that you're going to lose by not going with that other valued project is a relevant cost. So some costs that you have to pay anyway, not relevant. Opportunity costs, so if I do this, then I won't be able to do that with a piece of land. Or if I use this excess capacity within the factory to run my project, then I won't be able to expand my business. All of those opportunity costs are relevant to the cost of your project. The next is side effects. Um, let's say we are, um, oh, I'm terrible at this because I don't know car, car companies or car brands very well. So let's say I'm Ford and I do a Mustang and a Ford Explorer and a Ford Jeep. I don't know if they make Jeeps, but let's say um, I, I run the, ex I have the Explorer and I have a Jeep and I'm thinking about starting uh, the Mustang line. If I believe that when I start the Mustang line, line of cars, it's going to cause more people to be aware of my brand. And so they may not buy a Mustang, but they might buy more Explorers. The, the fact that starting the, your project, starting the Mustang line, might be posit, have a positive effect on a, the Explorer line, that's relevant. So that positive side effect is a positive cash flow for your project. Additionally, if you start the Mustang, and I'm, I'm pretty sure Ford doesn't make Jeep, but let's pretend they do. So if, if Ford makes the Jeep, and when you start the Mustang, some people that were going to buy the Jeep now are going to buy the Mustang instead. That negative effect on the Jeep line is also relevant. So you're not just looking, when you're trying to figure out the value of a project, you're not just looking at the cost, the, the, the cash flow you're going to generate from selling this project. You're looking at the side effect it's going to have on all of your other project lines. Sometimes it has positive effects. People know your brand more, and they may not buy this project, this product, but they'll buy a different product in your product line. Other times they may substitute your product for another product in your product line, and so it has a negative effect. All of those side effects, whether you're eroding the um, Jeep brand or you're benefiting the Explorer brand, all of that is relevant to the, um, the value you're creating if you, if you undertake starting to uh, sell a Mustang. As I said, that when we are coming up with cash flows, the first thing we do is we create a pro forma income statement. And a pro forma income statement is forward looking. So what do we expect if we undertake this project and we expect to sell Mustangs for 10 years? What do we expect our revenues will look like? What will our costs be? So we, we forecast our income statement for selling the Mustang line, lane, line of cars for the life of the, the line. So we're assuming we're going to sell them for 10 years. Once you create that pro forma income statement, we then convert it to cash flow numbers. And we do that using this formula that we learned earlier, this operating cash flow. So then we're going to use that formula. And then um, in addition to the cash flows from selling your product that's going to be relevant, you're also going to have some expenditures. So if you're going to sell the Mustang, you're going to have to build a factory or use excess capacity, that would be a relevant cost too. Um, you, may have to, um, uh, you may have to add to that factory over time as you continue to expand. You may decide in year three the Mustang's going to take off and you're going to need um, an additional line to run or, or you may need to um, run two shifts of workers so your cost would, in, would increase. Well, any additional capital spending, any additional asset that you need in order to run your business, that's relevant to the, um, the cost too. So you may buy a factory today for $100,000, and then after three years, uh, if demand is high, you may be forecasting, you need to have, uh, you need to expand the factory and spend another 50,000. 
all of the costs to associate it with the big assets needed to run the business are relevant. Also relevant is the cost of shutting down. So if you're assuming the Mustang is going to sell for 10 years, and then at the end of that, you're going to sell your, your factory, that the cost, the, the um, cash flow you're going to gen generate from selling that factory is also relevant. And we'll talk about salvage value of, um, of that asset that you sell, and it's on an after-tax basis. And then also networking capital. Remember, working capital is the difference between your current assets and your current liabilities. That's an asset of the company. So your working capital is the stuff you need to run your business. If you're going to run your business, you got to have inventory. You've got to extend credit so you have accounts receivables. That's your, your working capital. And typically, as you grow your business, you need to invest in working capital. And as it grows more, you need to invest more. So if we are forecasting that in year one, we're going to sell 5,000 um, uh, uh, Mustangs, then we need a certain level of inventory. We need to extend a certain level of credit. If by year four, we're going to be selling 100,000 um, uh, Mustangs, we're going to need a lot more inventory. We're going to have extended a lot more credit so that we're going to build up that working capital account over time. That's a cost to this project. So remember, that's a use of, of cash. And so um, building up a working capital becomes a relevant cash flow. Now, the one thing that's not a relevant cash flow that is cash is the interest expense. If you build a factory to, to manufacture Mustangs, you're going to um, you're, you're typically going to borrow money in order to build this factory. If you borrow money, you're going to create interest expense. Interest expense is relevant. It's a cost that you pay, but it's not a cost of operations. It's a financing cost. So if you think back about the cash flow statement, you have cash flow from uh, operations, from financing, from investing. Interest expense will come in, and it's relevant, and we pay attention to it when we talk about how we finance the project. What we don't want to do is the decision to build the, a, a, um, a Mustang factory should be based on what kind of value, what kind of cash flows we're going to be able to create from operating this factory. It shouldn't be impacted by how we choose to finance it. We take that into consideration elsewhere. So although interest expense is a, is a use of cash, we're going to take that into consideration elsewhere. It is not a relevant cash flow associated with undertaking the project. Um, from, uh, from an operating standpoint. Okay, now this should just freak you out. Um, we're going to stop here in terms of slides. So we only look at one slide, but I want to do a couple of practice problems, um, uh, sort of thought problems before we get started. This Baldwin company is what we're going to do right immediately after the test, so be sure you have read the chapter and watched the videos. I know it's hard to do on days that we have um, a, a quiz that you're so focused on chapters one through five. But this, this chapter is critically important, and you need to have some familiarity, or you're just going to be lost, and it's going to be really tough to catch up. So be sure and, um, and do some pre-work for Chapter 6. Okay, now what I want to do is on page 195 in your book, there's a whole series of, of um, good little questions to make sure you understand the basics of some of what I just talked about. So I want to walk through those. What I suggest you do is I'm, I'm going to tell you which problem I'm going to be talking about. And so I, I'd like you to shut off the, um, uh, the recording, go through and see um, if you have the, the answers, and then listen to me explain them. So don't just listen because um, it, it may sound like it makes sense, and then you go back later and you're, and you're confused. So the first one we're going to do on page 195 is number two. It's called incremental cash flows. So stop me now, look through and see, and uh, come up with your answers, and then restart. Okay, so we want to know what are incremental cash flows for our project. The first one says, we have a reduction in the sales of a company's other products caused by the investment. Yeah, that's an incremental cash flow. That's erosion of the other product line. So if I'm running Mustang and I now sell fewer Jeeps, I'm almost positive Jeep is not made by Ford now. Sorry about that. Okay, so if I'm, if I'm running, if I'm going to start a Mustang line and it's going to cause my other, other product line of Jeep to sell fewer cars, then that's erosion, and that's relevant, and we will take that into consideration when we come up with a cash flow. Next is we're going to expand a plant and equipment that has not yet been made and will be made only if the project accepts it. So I have a plant and equipment, and I'm going to expand it if I take on this project. That's a relevant cost because I'm not going to, it's incremental. It only is going to exist if I start selling Mustangs and expand my plant. So that cost we would take into consideration. 
Um, cost of, re of R and D undertaken three years ago during the past three years, that's a sunk cost. We have to pay that regardless of whether or not we do this project. So it's not relevant. Um, we would not take that into consideration. Company has to pay it, of course, but the Mustang project shouldn't be saddled with that cost because it's got to be paid one way or the other. Uh, annual depreciation from the investment, it's not a cash flow. It is, it is relevant because we're going to calculate operating cash flows and it's EBIT plus depreciation minus taxes. But this question asks if this is an incremental cash flow and depreciation is not a cash flow. It's, it's, a, it's a matching expense. Next is dividends paid by the firm. Dividends are a sort, or I'm sorry, are use of cash. They're an expense, but they're not part of operations. If you think back to our cash flow statement, it's, um, it's, cash flow from operations, from financing, and from investing. Um, so it does not fall under, um, under the uh, cash flow from operations. It's financing. So it's because we have equity, we pay dividends. So we would not take dividends into consideration when we're trying to decide whether or not we should undertake a, a building a, a Mustang line within our product line. Okay, the resale value of the plant and equipment at the end of the project life. That's relevant. So we expend money to build a, a, a Mustang plant, plant now, and we expect at the end of the life of the project that we can sell that the remains of that plant. Somebody else may want to acquire it. We may sell it for scrap. Regardless, there's going to be a, a positive cash flow at the end of the life. That's relevant. And when we're deciding whether or not we should undertake this project, we have to take that into consideration as well. Okay, and then G is salary and medical costs for production personnel who will be employed only if the project is, is um, accepted. Yeah, that's relevant. If, if we're thinking about the income statement, it's sales, less costs. They would fall within that cost. So we're hiring more people and we're going to have medical expense because we hired people. That's relevant to the project. So that's a nice little problem on, on um, reiterating in your brain what is a, a relevant cash flow for operations. Now take a look at number three. And for number three, again, pause, read it, See what your answers are, and then uh, and then take a look. All right, so we're selling steel shaft at golf clubs. Um, so we want to see which costs are not relevant. So we have land that we own um, that will be used for the project, but otherwise it will be sold for seven hundred thousand. This is an interesting one. If we bought that land for a million dollars and we're selling it for seven hundred thousand, the relevant cost is seven hundred thousand. It doesn't matter what we paid for the land originally. We paid $100,000 for it originally, but we can sell it for $700,000 today. The relevant cost is $700,000. It's what's the market value of that asset today. So yes, the $700,000 is a relevant cost for this project. Okay, we're going to have a $300,000 drop in the sale of steel shafts as we build these titanium woods. Absolutely, that's the erosion to a product line. So that $300,000 is a negative cost associated with this project. Um, Okay, we spent 200000 last year on R&D to figure out how to build these uh, graphite shafts. That's not relevant. We have to, it, it is a cost the company has to pay, but we have to pay that cost regardless of whether or not we choose to go forward with the project. So it's a sunk cost. It's not relevant. Okay, hopefully you did well on that one. All right, take a look at number four. Again, stop it, read it, and then, uh, and then come on back. Now, I didn't talk about... Um, Makers. Makers is modified, accelerated, um, come on, modified, accelerated, it's accelerated depreciation, cash recovery system, modified, accelerated cash recovery system. So it's, it's depreciation. Most of the time when we talk in finance about depreciation, we talk about straight line um, depreciation. So if you spend $100,000 for an asset and you're going to have it for five years, you're going to write off $20,000 per year over five years, and then the asset will be fully depreciated. Well, there are schedules set out that for some assets, you can depreciate them more quickly. And for instance, uh, technology. If for a company that, um, that um, sells computers or, or runs big mainframes, they can uh, depreciate those more quickly. And there's a schedule of how quickly you can, de you can depreciate them. The, um, the schedule allows for the fact that these things are going to become obsolete, and so you can accelerate more quickly. This problem is asking, would you like to use uh, accelerated depreciation or straight line? If you think about it, when you depreciate um, on your income statement, it reduces the amount of tax that you have to pay. So 
it feels like a higher cost up front because your, your profits are going to be negatively impacted, but your cash flow is going to be po positively impacted. Because depreciation, even if you accelerate it, no cash leaves your, leaves your hand. You're just reducing the value of your asset more quickly. When you increase your depreciation expense, the, your taxable income decreases, so your taxes decline. So even though your profits may be negatively impacted, your cash flows are positively impacted. So companies like, um, to, look, like to use accelerated depreciation schedules, and almost all companies do. It, it's, it's a smart financial decision to accelerate your depreciation. So that's very, very common. And um, in the book, they give some accelerated schedules. If I were asking you to do a problem, I would have to give you the schedule. You don't need to memorize accelerated schedules. Different assets have different accelerated schedules. And yeah, for the most part, a company would very much, much like to use accelerated depreciation because the asset's written off quickly. And so when it's written off quickly, it reduces your taxable income. Okay, the next one is number five. Pause me again and take a look at number five. Okay. In this problem, what you typically do with working capital, so I'm going to start this, uh, this line of, um, of Mustangs. And initially, in order to get started, I've got to build up some inventory. So um, initially, I may have to buy a piece of land. I may have to build a factory. All those are initial costs. You typically, you can't get started if you don't have raw materials. So you start to build up an inventory account as well. That's an investment. That's a cash outflow in inventory in the early years. As you continue to grow, you may need to increase the amount of inventory and increase the amount of raw materials you have in order to not have shortages. So typically, as projects grow, your working capital accounts grow as well. And so you'll see, you'll see an increase in working capital over time. For the purposes of our, of our projects, we typically assume that all of the cash flows that are all of the working capital that you increase over time, you recover in the last year of the project. It makes sense, but let's let's think this through. So I'm building up raw materials. If I know I'm only going to sell uh, Mustangs for 10 years and then people aren't going to care about them much anymore, and so I'm going to shut down the product after 10 years. In that in that 10th year, I'm not going to keep buying raw materials. I'm going to use the raw materials that I have in place. So in that 10th year, um, I'm essentially using up what is, has built up in working capital. I'm going to, my account's receivable. I'm going to collect on those as my sales start to dwindle. So, so uh, in essence, all of the working capital that you acquire through time, you recover in the last year. Um, let's see. And you typically assume that, um, that you recover it at market value. Now, um, let's take, let's see, what's, a pop, what's been a popular thing? Uh, you guys probably remember Beanie Babies from when you were kids. Okay, so Beanie Babies, um, for the company that makes them, it's Thai Manufacturing. Uh, uh, let's say um, Thai Manufacturing started building up all of the inventory of Beanie Babies, and then the demand for them crashed. They've got all of this inventory of um, Ferdinand the Bulls in, in, uh, in stock, and nobody wants them anymore. So in all likelihood, they're going to have to sell them to the dollar store or something at far less than the market value. If you know that your inventory is going to not be worth as much, that the market value is less, you're going to have to write it down. But in general, for most of the problems we do in here, we assume that all of the working capital that we build up throughout the life of the project, we recover all of it at, at its market value in the last year of the project's life. Um, and we'll see that when we do the Baldwin example. Now I want you to skip down to number nine and take a minute um, to take a look at number nine. All right, so we publish a, a big textbook, and now we're thinking about publishing an essentials textbook. And an essentials is just a, a, an abbreviated version. So it goes through, and some textbooks have 30 chapters, and they'll say, well, what are the 15 most important chapters? And, and they'll create a, a, a modified version of the original book. When they do that, you absolutely have to expect you're going to erode some of the demand for the um, the larger textbooks. So that would be um, that would be re um, uh, relevant. You're going to receive less revenue because the the essentials book tends to be cheaper. So because it's a it's a modified smaller version, um, so your price should come down. Um, it may it may have impact on your uh, main product as well because 
people think that um, the quality of the essential book isn't as good. And so they, uh, they may think less of your company, so it may erode your brand a bit. On the other hand, you may hit a market that wasn't willing to pay $300 for a textbook, but they'll pay $150 for a textbook. So you may access some students or some schools that didn't previously purchase from you, so it may have positive effects on your other brand. So all of those are, are um, considerations that you should think about when you think about um, uh, creating a, a, another product that is a subset of your existing products. All right, we're now going to look at problems 10, 11, and 12. So read that section on Cayenne um, and Porsche, and then after you have read that, um, take a look at problems 10, 11, and 12, and then we'll talk about those in just a second. Okay, great. Problem 10. You know I'm terrible with cars, and now we're going to talk about Porsche. Okay, so problem 10 is looking at Porsche, and they're, they're introducing an SUV. And 10 said, um, would you consider um, that introducing the SUV could be damaging to Porsche's um, reputation? Would that be a, um, a, an example of erosion? Absolutely. Anytime you do anything that could have an impact on your overall brand, your company overall, or on any of your, um, your existing products, if it could have any sort of negative uh, effect, it most definitely is erosion. It's why some companies, it, it's why um, right now Walmart is looking at uh, selling Lord & Taylor merchandise on its website, and people are immediately going, what is Lord & Taylor doing affiliating with Walmart? So um, it, it, that decision, while it may expand the number of people that see Lord & Taylor merchandise, there are some customers of Lord & Taylor that are going, I'm done being a customer of them because uh, um, I don't want to affiliate with, with Walmart. Jet had the same effect. Um, some people were saying, you know, I liked Jet, but not associated with Walmart. So those are, that's erosion of the brand, even though um, what Lord & Taylor has to decide is, is the net effect positive. So some of my customers are not going to like us anymore because we're associated with Walmart. But if I, I reach a broader swath of the population, that erosion is offset by the additional sales I'll have from more people know about Lord & Taylor and can access us easily online. So yeah, if, uh, if the Cayenne um, reduces the, um, the value of the Porsche brand, that erosion is most definitely, should have been taken into consideration when Porsche decided to, um, to create the Cayenne Turbo S. Okay, number 11. Um, Let's see. Um, so um, not everybody entered the SUV market. So what about Porsche and what about them coming in late? You know, with, with in any market, you see first to market companies. Um, uh, Apple introduced the uh, well, I guess Samsung beat them to it. Um, uh, Samsung introduced um, uh, facial recognition on their on their phone. They're first to market. Apple's following on and supposedly will do it better. Uh, so that's the next line. Other companies are not yet doing that just because they're, they're sort of waiting and letting the, the um, tech leaders test the market doesn't mean that they won't enter that market at some point. So what Porsche has to decide at the point in time that they're thinking about the Cayenne is they have to decide whether or not there's still enough market share that they can capture and whether or not it will create value for the company. Just because they're not first to market doesn't mean that they can't be successful in the market. And just because all of their competitors haven't entered the market, that doesn't mean that it's not a good decision for Porsche to do it. You know, um, uh, it, it may be that um, BMW doesn't want to do a, um, a sports utility vehicle. And I'm guessing they probably have one. But let's say BMW didn't want to do a sports utility vehicle. Just because a competitor decides not to do it doesn't mean that Porsche shouldn't decide not to do it. So... Um, uh, so even if others aren't doing it, it, it could still be of value to, uh, to Porsche. And number 12, let's see. Uh, uh, okay, so when you enter a market that already exists, you have to presume that when you enter that market, there's going, um, you're going to have competition. And so what may happen is some of the competitors may lower the price to make their products more attractive than yours. You may also need to lower price. So... Uh, when we typically forecast out what the revenues are going to look like for a product, oftentimes you'll see the product look at having a price increase for a period of time and then a price decrease because what you anticipate is as more competitors come into the market, you're going to need to make your price more competitive and that may mean um, lowering your price at some point in the future. When you're forecasting, all of that is highly relevant 
to the uh, the costs associated with undertaking this uh, this project. That's it. That's all I wanted to cover in chapter six. Um, once you've watched this, I highly urge you to go back through and um, take a look at this Baldwin example again, right after the uh, the test uh, next week or November seventh for you guys. Right after after your quiz, we'll do review of the week and then we'll jump right in and um, and work the way through Baldwin. Uh, it it's fun to do these. It just um, it's just getting things straight in your mind. If you keep in mind that we're talking about incremental cash flows. It becomes pretty um, uh, obvious if you if you ask yourself every time, do I have to pay this regardless of whether I go forward? If the answer is yes, it's not relevant. Is is the cost going to be different um, if I continue to produce or uh, if I undertake this project? Will there be additional costs or additional revenues or different additional impact? That's the question to ask when we're figuring out these cash flows, and we'll actually get into figuring them out next time. Good luck studying for the test. I'll see you. Happy Halloween. I'll see you in class on November 7th.